Hi everyone, I'm Les. And I'm Ashley. And you're listening to Anthropotamus, where we explore some of your favorite anthropology topics. Hey everyone, welcome. Today we are here with Dr. Aaron Stiles, professor at University of Nevada, Reno, here to discuss Islamic rights in Zanzibar. How are you doing, Dr. Stiles? I'm great. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's wonderful to be here. Well, we are super glad to have you here today. Um, so, I mean, before we get started in this article, so we're going to be talking mainly about um, the rights to marry in Zanzibar, which uh, you actually released a few years ago. Um, but, uh, I mean, with all the controversy and all the stereotypes about Islam and marriage and women, I mean, what got you started in studying Islam to begin with, and more specifically in Zanzibar? Oh, that is a long story. I'll try, <laughs> I'll try to be somewhat brief. Um, well, when I was an undergrad, I was I was very interested in cultural anthropology and in religion. And so I, I, I went back and forth between being a major in anthropology and then a major in religion and then a major in anthropology. And for some reason, my undergrad university didn't have double majors, I guess. I mean, that was a long time ago. But I do remember talking to a religious studies professor who I just loved at one point, Dr. Melvin Peters, and I said, Dr. Peters, I need to declare my major for finally, should I be an anthropologist or religious studies? And he said, well, I think you're really interested in religion as something that people do. So I think probably anthropology is the direction you should go. And I was a good student, so I don't think he was trying to get rid of me. But so that's, <laughs> how I, that's how I kind of landed in anthropology. Um, well, how I decided on that as my major, but I was very, I, when I was an undergrad, I studied abroad in Jerusalem and I was very interested in Islam and Islamic studies. And so, um, and I was very interested in the Middle East at that point. And so when I started my master's, I was, um, planning, I was, I was focusing on the Middle East. Um, and I did a summer, um, a summer of study, uh, this wonderful program at the American Research Center in Egypt that was in Cairo that was an Islamic studies program for graduate students in different disciplines. And so that kind of cemented my interest in Islamic studies. And then for my PhD, I went to a different university, Washington University in St. Louis, to work with um, an anthropologist, John Bowen, who's done a lot of work on Islam in, in Indonesia and elsewhere. And I was not interested in law at that point. I thought I was going to study Sufism, which is Islamic mysticism. And I planned I was going to study Sufism in Cairo, in Egypt. And I got to my PhD program and my new advisor said, oh, everybody studying Islam works in Egypt. You should work somewhere else. That's not true. But it was I thought, sure, I'll work. I'll definitely work somewhere else. So I um, decided to actually work in Eritrea in Northeast Africa. And I'd taken a class on religion, law, and pluralism with that professor, and I loved it. And he was working on Islamic law and Islamic courts in Indonesia, and I just thought it was absolutely fascinating. So I developed a project to study um, Islamic law in terms of court choice in Eritrea. And so I went there for a summer of research for a couple months to, try, you know, to preliminary research to find a field site and make sure the project was feasible. And I was all set to go and, you know, I had my funding and I was ready to go for 18 months. And then um, a border war with Ethiopia that had had, that had been kind of simmering um, reignited, so to speak. And so it was really not the time for researchers to be going. And so I had to, I postponed for a while to see if things would calm down, but they wouldn't. And then Eventually, I just had to change my field site, and I, for funding purposes, I had to stay in East Africa, and so I ended up settling on Zanzibar, and um, which is a wonderful choice. So that's how, and so I, I, I was able, I had to work somewhere where there were Islamic courts, because that's what I've been planning on doing in Eritrea, and Zanzibar does have Islamic courts, as you know, from reading some of my work. So that's, um, that's how, that's how it came about. Was that, I hope that wasn't too long. <laughs> no, it wasn't at all. And you you spoke, said that really fast, so I'm sure that it didn't really seem very very long at all. Um, so so we're, so we have you know the right to marry. You came out a few years ago, um, and those who haven't read it, which I'm sure most of our listeners haven't, um, you just we think of. I mean, I think we still have this very negative stereotype. Women don't have rights in Islam. You know, we stay home and cover our faces, um, which is, which is not accurate, of course. And uh, I think it's, I found it 
Well, I find it very interesting to be able to, how do I word this? I mean, that we have these rights that we can take to court and use. Well, not me because I'm American, but um, in Islamic societies where we can use these, um, you know, these, these Islamic laws that actually do provide us rights and how, I mean, you see these women who are taking the initiative to say, hey, these are my rights. I should be getting this dowry or, or hey, this is the person I, I want to marry and taking that initiative to go and enforce those rights. Uh, which is which is really what this article discusses, and and you mentioned that you have noticed. I mean, you mentioned that there is an increase of women who are are doing this, going to court, taking their rights um, to marry who they who they like. And I mean, do do you have um, any opinion on why do you think that there's an increase now? Do you feel that Maybe it has to do with the increase of Islamic education, because I know you mentioned in the article about a lot of women actually do know their rights due to, um, you know, um, Islamic programming on the radio. Or do you feel it also has to do with um, a cultural change within the newer generation? That's a great question, Ashley. So, yeah, that's um, so the article that we're talking about today um yeah, I'm looking particularly at court cases in which young women take their fathers or their other guardians to court to demand the right to marry the man of their choice. And so these are situations in which, as you know, in which a father, for example, is not giving a young woman permission to marry um, the person she wants. And in, in Islamic law, in kind of classical Islamic law, most schools of most Islamic legal schools require a young woman who's getting married for the first time to have a marriage guardian, which is uh, could be her father or her grandfather, or it's usually a, a, a male relative. But um, and so so in these cases, these are young women who have not been married before, who want to marry, you know, their their boyfriend or the the man they love, and for some reason their father is saying no. And so what I'm looking at the cases the cases are few and far between. But what I thought was interesting is that, that there was an increase over time when I was working on this project. And this this project, my when I first started doing research in Zanzibar, I was really I wasn't looking at these cases. I was looking at um, more at cases where women were filing for divorce from their husbands or filing for improved maintenance from their husbands, which make up the vast majority of courts in the Islamic courts of Zanzibar and also in Islamic courts in other parts of the world. There's, you know, there is lots of other, not lots, I guess I should say, but there are other uh, um, anthropologists and socio-legal scholars who are looking at Islamic law and practice in the many, many places in the world where um, Muslims can resolve same marital disputes um, with recourse to Islamic law, and in most cases, it's mostly women. Where where you have Islamic courts, for example, or other courts that are that are striving to apply Islamic law, it's usually mostly women who are bringing cases to the court, and they're often very successful. And so I, you know, so. And up until when I published this article a few years ago, most of my research had looked at marital dispute cases or divorce cases. But, you know, in, in looking at all these, you know, my, my, my field notes from working in court and all these case files that I had, I realized this is pretty interesting that um, we do have a number of cases where women are approaching the court in order to 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 you know, to, to take their fathers and ask, you know, demand the right to marry. Um, so they're taking their fathers to court and they were increasing, they were increasing over time. And so, yeah, I think, again, I, I, I think this question needs more research, definitely. But yes, I think it is probably because of increasing access to education. Um, in young women tend to be in 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 Zanzibar. You know, when I, I started doing research there about twenty years ago, so or even more, so it was quite a long time ago. But even at that point, the vast majority of young people, even in rural areas where I worked, kids were. I mean, pretty much everybody was in school. They were in the state-run schools, and then they were also in Quran school. So um, almost every kid was going. You know, having kind of a state state education and then also an Islamic education. Um, and, and girls were excelling. I did, I mean, I didn't, I haven't studied education specifically, but I have, you know, interviewed some teachers. And one of the things that I, 
I remember a lot of teachers saying was that girls tended to really excel in school more so than the boys. Um, and so it was very, you know, and I think that that was that at that point, it was mostly women who were under under about 40 who'd been who had been able to to secure many many years of education so i do think that that has something to do with it and also i think that you know there is um even though people do use the islamic courts frequently there is there is a little bit of there's a little bit of stigma not toward not really to divorce um say but there is a bit of stigma for going to court so in a sense that some you know some women are really confident and really you know really like, I have no problem going to court. This is my right as a Muslim woman. I can demand a divorce from my husband. I can demand my husband maintain me. I can insist that my father allow me to marry this appropriate man that I want to marry. Um, but then other women, like I say in the article, have kind of chosen a different path and are saying, well, yeah, even though that is my Islamic right, I'm just going to let God take care of it. I'm not going to enact that right and God will just take care of me and God will take care of <laughs> my delinquent husband or whatever. So it is kind of a different approach. And some other people, particularly maybe the older generation, there was some hesitancy about going to court in the, in the sense of why, you know, you really should resolve these matters at home. You shouldn't be going out into this, you know, to taking things to court and, and letting everybody kind of see your dirty laundry. So I think that, yeah, so it's a great question, Ashley. I don't have a definitive answer um, but I think that it is probably because of um, because over the years of increasing access to education. Um, so and, and again, like I say in the article, it was um, all all of the cases I looked at where where women were taking their fathers or other guardians to court. All of them were between, between there was one who reported her age at, 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 at as 40, age 40, and everybody else was between 18 and 22 or 24. So really quite young women who were doing this. And you just uh, you just mentioned how women you just mentioned how women um, choose not to use those rights. Um, and to me, being uh, uh, this is you know being American Muslim, this is probably very my American perception uh, and cultural uh, interpretation of the faith. But to me, not using your rights is a form of not practicing. So, I mean, I mean, how is it? Do you? That's a, yeah, Ashley. That's a great question and a great comment. Did I cut you off or? Could... No, I think you get what I'm trying to say, though. <laughs> I mean, I think that I think that's a really great question, and I think it's. I think that you know the women I talk to, who I mean, I've talked to tons of women who have opted to go to court, right, to handle these issues, and are very confident in their decisions and have no regrets. And women are often very successful in the court you know like if your husband is not supporting you or not supporting your children and you go to court and that's established he will be ordered to support you i mean if that you know after if you, witnesses and evidence are brought in if there's really a, a pretty high success rate but i think the women who i talked to who did not wish to do this they actually often would frame it as a matter of piety and i think the reason is is that in in i mean this is nobody told me this Exactly. But there's in, in Islam, there's a there's a scale of legal acts from things that are mandatory to things that are forbidden. So there's like kind of five degrees of how you can rate acts legally. And so and so divorce, for example, is something that is it is permitted. It is not forbidden, but it's also not recommended. Right. And so that's so. So divorce is absolutely permitted according to Islamic law, but it's not something that is encouraged. It's certainly not mandatory, of course, but it's also not something that's encouraged. It's discouraged unless you unless you need to do that. And so I think that so in terms of understanding that decision not to pursue those rights by saying, not one good example is, a, I think I mentioned in the article, a very close friend of mine who had been married and divorced and had a kid and her husband was not supporting the child. And that is his responsibility, according to Islamic law, to support his child, even after divorce, of course. And so I would always say, well, why don't you just go to the, go to the Qadi, go to the judge and, you know, tell him what's going on and then he'll make your husband support your child. And she just would say, no, no. 
I, you know, and she would say, you know, I'm so devout that I'm going to let God handle it. I'm not going to take it. And so she was framing it as a religious choice that she did not want to go to court. And she was telling me it was because of a matter of her piety. And I think probably it was, you know, it was, and we did talk about this a lot. And she didn't reference the scale of legal acts, but it wasn't, you know, it's not required to do that. And so she was making that decision that it is not a religious obligation for me to, to, to take him to court. It is an option, but it's not an obligation. And so I think that's kind of where you see the, the line there. But I think that's, that's a great question. And that's, again, I haven't, um, I, as you pointed out, this, this article came out a few years ago, and I haven't been, I haven't been working on this project since then. And I do, I do have a new project starting in Zanzibar that I started pre-pandemic, and hopefully I'll get to go back next year when it's easier to travel and finish it. But that one's focusing more on inheritance. So I do think, um, again, so I don't have, you know, I don't have new, new data or anything on, on that question. But I think it's, I think it is, you know, it's a matter of individual choice in terms of how women think about what you know what it means to them to to be a good muslim and i think that you're not always going to get as you know of course right so that not everybody's going to agree on the course of action you can certainly imagine women debating okay well you know if your husband isn't maintaining you or your father's not letting you marry the person you want to marry what what is the best course of action is it is it to go to court like as you know as a a devoted Muslim woman is it is it, is it best to go to court or is it best to kind of persevere and ride it out and I think people will disagree and I think that um oh, well let me I'll pause there for a second I hope I answered your question <laughs> you did you did I had something I wanted to uh to add on that one and just sort of um you know add a little bit of a question here um when I was reading through it that particular section made me think uh, it, it was it seemed like it was a um you know the conflict between the uh local culture and the religious culture yeah. now is that is that kind of what you got from from that from your studies there um was it more of a religious versus local um custom that's a, wonder, that's a wonderful question yeah and i think one of the reasons that i wanted to write that article was because and i think this this actually harkens back to ashley's initial comments opening the the our talk today is that um yeah there's there 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 you know for for years i would hear people say like i open kind of up with an article talking about this that if only people would adhere more closely to islamic law women would be better off you know they would they would have more rights and have a better kind of a better, better, better situation in terms of marriage or what have you. And so, yeah. And so, so, you know, when I very first started doing research in Zanzibar, I was, you know, kind of, I, I was doing research with, I was doing some interviews with, with, um, with some legal experts and um, other kinds of professionals who were interested in, in law and women's rights. And that was, that was a common refrain. I mean, I heard that frequently that, oh, if only people would adhere more closely to Islamic law, women would, the position of women would be so much better off. Like, for example, the, in terms of the, the mahar, the mahari in Swahili that comes from the Arabic term mahar, which is a bridal gift, a gift that the husband and, you know, and his family usually give to the bride um, at the time of the wedding or after the wedding. And in, in Zanzibar, very frequently, as you know from reading the article, that is given to the parents and not necessarily given to the bride, right? And so you see in that article, yeah. there's that conversation with the young women, Rahima and Wana Harusi, who are, you know, kind of imagining what it's, how great it's going to be when they get married and they get the Mahari and <laughs> they're going to have some, you know, they're going to have some property. And I should say this is Zanzibar and it's part of Tanzania. It's not a wealthy country at all. Yeah. Um, and I was working in a rural area and it was, you know, not, it's certainly, it's a, it, it is not a, not a wealthy area. A lot of people are struggling. And so the young women were really imagining how nice it would be to have some, you know, have some property. And of course that didn't play out exactly, especially with Mana Harusi's wedding that her father received the the wedding gift and she only received a small portion of it and so that you know that's one thing that experts would say well you know according to the law that is the property of the bride she should be getting that money or that and it usually it, in Zanzibar it's usually it's usually cash it's usually money but it could be other kinds of property as well 
and so so that's one of the things well we have this norm that elders are the ones who take that and then they decide how to use it and maybe they'll buy things for the bride for her you know for her married life in zanzibar typically the bride the, the husband provides the house and the the wife provides a lot of the furnishings for the house and the dishes and things like that and so um so yeah and then in terms of you know in terms of just you know, just deciding on on a marriage partner and accepting a proposal. Those are those are things that that yeah, there is that norm, that cultural norm of adhering to elder authority, even if you know, as a young woman, you know that okay, I have the right in Islam to refuse this suitor, to not marry this man that my parents approve, you know, accept, you know, my, my parents accepted as a suitor. But a lot of young women, as you, as you see in the article, not all, but, but young, a lot of young women will say, okay, well, you know, my, my parents have approved this guy. And so I'll marry him, even though I don't really want to. And so, and so that is an area where people, you know, women themselves will differentiate between what is permissible according to Islamic law and what is typical according to Zanzibar culture. And so, yeah, that is, that is a very good example of that, that issue of where, you know, understandings of Islamic law do come in conflict sometimes with cultural understandings. And, and actually I'm glad you asked that question last because my new project, if you don't mind me talking a little bit about the new project. Not at all. That was my last question. Oh, really? (laughs) Do you want me to wait or should I? No, go into it. The only other question that I had uh, on deck was actually about the uh, the dowries. And um, uh, in particular, it seemed to me that the local custom is that your, your parents or your guardian would generally keep the dowry for themselves. And it, uh, it did seem like a lot of these cases where the divorces came into play, it was uh, when the elders were you know, making the choices more for their financial interests than anything else. That, that, yeah, I think, I mean, a lot of elders will use the, 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 the mahari to buy things for the bride, you know. It's not that they're just always pocketing it. So, um, okay. but yeah, and I think that, yeah, the, in terms of what, I, I, yeah, your other question about whether, the divorces are resulting from these marriages that maybe the elders approved and the the young people didn't want. I don't actually don't, I don't know. I mean, I th- I think there's there's a lot of um, there's a lot of there's there is a lot of. <laughs> I mean, there's there's there there are a lot of divorces. People, the divorce rate is pretty high, and there's very little stigma attached to divorce. I mean, really, women. I mean, I've known people who've had gotten married and divorced five times, and there's there, the stigma really comes about from men who divorce wives frequently because in in Zanzibar men maintain the right to divorce their wives unilaterally outside of a court and that's 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 part of classical islamic law it's a divorce called talaq in arabic or referred to as talaka in swahili and lots of states around the world that that incorporate islamic law have really have really kind of circumscribed men's ability to, to divorce their wives unilaterally, but not Zanzibar. It's still possible to do that. And so the stigma really comes in when a man is divorcing his wife quite a bit and you know, divorcing wives repeatedly. Women are often refer, I mean, women are often kind of viewed as well, kind of the victims of, 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 mercurial men who are just divorcing and remarrying at will. So, but yeah, and yeah, so in terms of the that. causes for divorce, I mean, it's, it's often, in ter- I mean, I've studied a lot of divorces and I've, I've never heard anybody say in court, we're getting divorced because my parents approve this marriage and I don't want it. Like it's, that's, I've never heard anybody say that. It doesn't mean that it's not happening. It's typically, and it's not, you know, what, what's usually happening is, when women are coming to court filing for divorce, it's usually because their husbands, the reasons they bring to court are their husbands have either left them or they're not maintaining them and the children, if there are children properly, they're not supporting them. And so, or sometimes a husband is abusive. Um, if abuse, even verbal abuse in Zanzibar is actually, is a criminal matter. So, so if someone comes in and says she wants a divorce because her husband's abusive, but usually they'll be sent, she'll be sent to the police um, because that's, you know, that's even verbal abuse is a criminal offense. Um, and so usually what happens if a woman comes in and says, I want a divorce because my husband's calling me all these nasty names, what will happen is the clerks will ask her, okay, is there anything, if, it, if it's just the abuse, then we need to send you to the police, you know, you need to go talk to the police about this 
right now. But if there are other issues, then we can, you know, we can talk through it and open a case in court because that's, um, that's, that's, you know, it's it, it, rather than just going straight to the police. And so usually what happens is, okay, yeah, my husband's calling me all these bad words, these bad names, these insults, but he's also, you know, never coming home at night and he never, he's not supporting me and he's not supporting the kids. So there's usually, that's usually what makes up the, the, you know, the, the, the grounds for divorce in terms of filing in court. So I think that's a really interesting question, Les. Maybe you should do a project on that. But I don't know in terms of whether, in terms of whether, um, whether or not that, you know, divorces, I mean, divorces are more often occurring um, in those sort of arranged marriages. Um, I'm not really sure. And often what happens is that, you know, they're not, they're kind of, I would say, maybe semi arranged. Um, it's often that, you know, a young woman and a young man develop a relationship and then, you know, it's kind of like the, the young man kind of quote unquote chooses and says, okay, well, I'm interested in Ashley. And so I'm going to talk to my elders and they're going to go talk to her family. And then he and Ashley have already, sorry, Ashley, bring you <laughs> relationship, you know? And so it's not, yeah, it's not usually the kind of, it's not usually the kind of arranged marriage where, people don't know, you know, the parents are doing everything and the, the young people don't know each other until they're getting married. Usually they do know each other. I mean, so, right. so it's, um, but, it, and usually it's, you know, how people kind of frame it is usually the, the boy, the young man, you know, approaches his parents or his elders and says, I'm really interested in Ashley. Can we go talk to her family? And, and so frequently it's, you know, a, the young people will certainly know each other and, and frequently will have, you know, like each other and all of that. So, um, yeah. but that, I think that's a great question. And I think that would be worthy of study to see if that's, if that's, you know, if, if there is a correlation there between, um, choice of spouse and, and divorce. And I just, yeah, I can't answer that one fully for you. So um, okay. but that was a good question. Well, I appreciate what you have answered for that. Uh, yeah. Did you want to head into your uh, your next project, I believe you said? Yeah. So, yeah, that was, again, your question about Islamic law, how Islamic law is understood versus how people understand certain cultural norms is great. And that is something I'm looking at in my next project, which will be focusing on inheritance. Um, in, in the courts that I've worked in, in the rural parts of Zanzibar, there are always very, very few in inheritance cases, even though the Islamic courts in Zanzibar do have jurisdiction over inheritance cases. And I'd always, whenever I asked about that, people would kind of laugh and say, well, we're poor, we don't have any property, there's nothing to argue over, so there's no inheritance cases. So kind of make a, a joke of it, though there's, you know, maybe some truth to that. So so I very rarely um, have, have looked at inheritance cases in the courts, but there certainly are inheritance disputes that are going on outside of the courts. So that's what I will be looking at. And what, I, what, I, what I'm going to be looking at as um, a... a, a Cases in which typically women, though not always, are denied their inheritance rights on the argument that even though they are supposed to inherit from so-and-so, according to Islamic law, that Zanzibar custom says that, no, that property needs to go somewhere somewhere else. And so I'm going to be, um, so it's it's looking at that same sort of issue about that conflict in certain kinds of disputes between how people understand custom, Zanzibari custom, and how people understand Islamic law. And so, um, and so this is something, and that I was, I was, I was, I was kind of um, alerted to this a, a few years ago by um, an article that a friend sent me from Reuters, actually. Um, there's just a, you know, little short um, article in, and in the press about cases in which, this was specifically looking at women, women in rural areas were being denied inheritance um, by male relatives by saying, oh no, it's our custom that the male, the men here inherit everything and not the women. And, um, and so I thought, oh, that's interesting. You know, this isn't something I've looked at. Um, and I, you know, I just don't know that much about inheritance disputes. So I started going back over my all the case files that I've had from the court for many years. And I did find a couple of cases, you know, that I sat in on years ago and I have ethnographic data on and court records on. And it looked like, I mean, I'd never written about them because I, you know, I never focused on inheritance and all. I just collected them because I was there. And it looked like these cases, that was something that, that could have been, um, 
a factor. So there's one case I was looking at where two sisters had come in and to court because they had felt male relatives were denying them inheritance from their father um, in terms of some land and some other kinds of property. And so um, I went back to Zanzibar in 2019 to, 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 get this project started. Um, and I was, I wasn't, I wasn't able to stay for very long, but, um, it was a kind of a preliminary research trip to see if this would be a feasible project. And it certainly would. And, um, I was, I was, I'm really curious about starting to explore how these inheritance disputes are taking place, but primarily outside of the courts and how people are, you know, when a dispute is happening and whether or not people feel comfortable and why taking that dispute to some kind of, if not to the court, some other kind of authority figure in the community to try to resolve these situations. So, um, yes, yeah, so that's that will be the next project. And hopefully we're not able to go this summer, but hopefully next summer I will be back and, and working on that project in Zanzibar. I did, I did have a random question because I was I was reviewing your bio again earlier today. And it did mention something about, I don't know how up to date your bio is on the UNR website, but I uh, had mentioned that you were starting doing research uh, on Mormons in Utah. Yes, that is, yes, I have. I'm actually, yes, very much immersed in that project right now. I'm working on a book on spiritual experiences among Mormons in northern Utah. So very, very different from my work in Zanzibar, but I started doing research in Utah um, a few years ago, it was I have kids, and you know, it's Zanzibar is really far away, and it's really hard to get <laughs> yeah, there, yeah. and it's hard to leave the kids, it's hard to take the kids, and so I started a project closer to home, actually in home at home because I'm I'm from northern Utah, and so I yeah, so what I've been researching in Utah is um, spirit experiences, so how people have experiences of spirit visitations, which is not oh, uncommon, wow. and it's just an absolutely fascinating part of Mormon theology. And so I'm kind of studying that, how that, that those theological ideas about the reality of spirits come to life in people's experience. So how people are visited um, most often by benevolent spirits of ancestors or relatives, or sometimes um, spirit children that are, you know, are yet to be born, but sometimes they're visited by, by evil spirits. So yeah, so that is absolutely up to date. And I am working on that project. I'm actually just about to finish the third chapter of a book on the subject, and I'm hoping to have that book all done by this time next year. Wow, that is sounds very interesting. <laughs> We're going to have to have you back on to talk about that when you're finished. Yeah. I would love to talk about that project. It's Yeah, it's wonderful. It's been absolutely fascinating. It's really different from the work in Zanzibar, of course, but it's you know, and under the, the broad umbrella of the anthropology of religion and but working on spirit experiences rather than religion and law. But yes, I'd be more than happy to come talk about it. Where can our listeners find your work? Oh, well, um, that is, they can contact me. I think that, you know, if they have access to a university library, um, it should be pretty easy to find. But they can contact me at my e-styles at unr.edu email, and I'd be more than happy to send a PDF of the article. Okay, okay. And we'll we'll go ahead and we'll include your uh, your email in the description. Oh, or we can uh, put the the link to her bio. And, and then and then your emails in that bio, right? Yep, either one. That, that, that both of those work definitely. Great. All right. Well, thank you again Dr. Styles for joining us today. We It was my pleasure. I... Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you all for listening. Please continue to follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Anthropotamus for our latest episodes, show notes, and book discussion schedule.